So I'm Jonathan Katz. Uh, I work at AWS. I'm also on the core team of the Postgres project. And uh, for better or worse, I have been staring at this problem of vectors for well over a year now. And I'm very, you know, I'm very excited to talk about this topic today, which I'm terming vectors are the new JSON. And you know, maybe before we start, like, you know, it sounds kind of weird. Like, what do you mean vectors are the new JSON? Like, the, what, what, you know, that, that sounds like you're just trying to, you know, do something that's like clickbait or, you know, get attention to it. But, you know, allow me, you know, please, you know, entertain me for a bit. So here's a JSON document. And, you know, this seems, you know, it's, you know, it has some content in it. You know, it's about Postgres. You know, it contains something about supported versions. And we saw at one point that we might have, like, an application that, has this JSON document, and you're like, okay, cool, well, I love using Postgres, I'm gonna take that JSON document, I'm gonna turn it into a, a relational structure. Um, side note, I think that pretty much all JSON can be turned into a relational structure. And, you know, stored in a database. Cool. But then we just got the notion saying like, hey, you know, that seems like a lot of work. You know, I already have structured data. Might not necessarily have a, you know, a schema as we, as we know it from a database standpoint, but it has structure. Why can't I just take it and store it directly in a database? So people did that. You know, we saw a lot of these JSON databases or document databases come up in the in the late 2000s, and you know, you know, likewise, Postgres ended up supporting it, in part because you know, as I could say right here, you know, JSON's a data type. It's a complex data type, but it's just a data type. And one thing that Postgres does very well is that it stores a data type. And it stores it, you know, you know, it you know, basically has a representation in its storage that allows you to query it and manipulate it and get all sorts of insights on it. And that goes beyond just Postgres, you know, to, to be fair, that when you have a data type and you have a database or a data storage system, you can store it, you can query it, and you can do all sorts of things with it. Um, Postgres has a long, rich history with JSON, you know, starting back in uh, 2012. I mean, as JSON really became popular in the late, in the late 2000s with web apps, we saw like a huge demand for folks who just wanted to store their JSON data in Postgres because it either lived next to their other application data or it was their application data and it was just much simpler for what they were doing to be able to query it directly. Um, what was cool is you know, Postgres was the first relational database to, to be able to store JSON and lo and behold, it became part of the SQL standard, which is pretty neat. Now, fast forward a bit, right? You know, you know, this started back in 2000, let's go to 2024. And this notion of this like kind of weird line has become very popular. You know, this is a vector. And you know, to the best of my abilities, I drew a two-dimensional vector of you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 coordinates or attributes, bear with me. And a vector has two key properties. It has magnitude or size, you know, you know how big it is, and it has an angle. So basically, you have some kind of size and you know, you're pointing somewhere in space. It's kind of cool because you can add more attributes, more dimensions to it, and you can see that, okay, you know, here I am in three dimensions, or hopefully you can see the three dimensions. You know, I, my parents are grateful that I didn't go to art school. And you, know, you can see that I'm you know, pointing, you know, I can see where I am in space. Vectors are kind of old. You know, JSON's a newer data type. Vectors, there is, you know, they have some history to it. They have about, let's call it like 120, 130-ish of history, and there's this book in 1901 that you know, codified you know, the early mathematics to vectors. Now, back then you saw vectors in more mathematical applications around physics. You know, you kind of study vectors when you're learning about forces in physics or, or even in, you know, and then, you know, translate back to, you know, introductory computer science classes where you learn that you can have a vector as being a specialized form of an array. But vectors have become very popular as of late. Which again is interesting, right? Because I said, wait a second, like, you know, we kind of learn about vectors indirectly in an in introductory computer science class, but they're a big deal now in these storage systems. And it really is because of generative AI, which in some ways I take a step back even further. I think the reason why it's become very popular is that it's much simpler to use AI and ML systems today. Uh, true story, back when I was in college, I thought I was gonna go into machine learning. Like I was fascinated by the fact that you could like take these systems and you know, learn on them and be able to create inferences or, you know, some kind of artificial intelligence. It's something that really fascinated me. But at the time, I was looking at all the research going into machine learning and I was like, 
oh, everything's ad hoc. Whenever you want to do something, you have to build your own model. It takes time to train it. It's very exhaustive. You know, I'm impatient. I'm going to go into the startup world. I'm going to build web apps, you know, yada, yada, yada. And of course, you know, my, my, you know, why I kicked myself is I didn't have the foresight to see that this would be commoditized, that using these models would be as simple as making a REST call. And that's really the transformation in many ways, is that, yes, these models are much smarter and they're able to get these inferences that are much deeper today, but they're so accessible. Like, we can use them very easily. Like, you know, we can just go right now and, you know, you probably go in right now and have uh, one of these models build out the talk that I'm giving right now. And that, that's really cool. But the other key thing about what we're seeing with, you know, the big foundation models is that they're trained on public information or information that is widely distributed. You know, I like to think of like the entire internet as being that kind of database. But there's a lot of information that's in private databases. Information that, you know, you've been collecting for your applications or, you know, or, you know, or whatever, you know, whatever things that you're doing that the foundation models don't know, but yet there should be a way to be able to take that information that you have in your database and be able to use these foundation models to be able to build that generative AI experience or that richer, you know, add a richer AI experience to your applications. And the example I like to give is something called, uh, well, the technique that's become very popular is retrieval augmented generation, uh, which you know, I'll, I'll explain in a second, but I'll start with an example. So when I first built this out, I was sitting in my in-law's sunroom in Florida, and my father-in-law loves to collect you know, all sorts of like Florida tchotchkes, you know, that's like alligator heads, toucans, you know, all sorts of kind of birds. So I'm like, okay, let's say I had a store that was selling tchotchkes. And I took the example of like a blue elephant face, because you know, blue elephants, I kind of like them. And it's like, okay, well, let's say I go to a foundation model, and out of the blue, I'm like, how much does this cost in my store? And the foundation model is gonna be like, I don't know. I don't have access to the information in your store. I don't have access to that database. And that's where retrieval, augmenta uh, retrieval augmented generation comes in, which I'm just gonna say RAG from now on, because I'm gonna trip up over those words. But the idea with RAG is that you do have information in a private database that you can use to augment the model. So in this case, I have a product catalog, I have pricing information, I know how much a blue elephant vase costs, and when that question comes in, I can basically take that information residing in my database and put it into the, you know, the foundation model to be able to trigger the response, to which I could say, oh no. Yes, a blue elephant vase does cost about $20. And that's the really cool part is that you don't need to have to train your own foundation model to get that experience. You can take the information in your database and be able to augment that. Then the question becomes, that's great. How do I do that? And that's where the vector comes in. We basically need a way to be able to take the information in our database and have in some ways like a lingua franca or a universal language to be able to you know, move the information from the database to the foundation model and back. And you know, that's, where this, you know, this, that's where this occurs in the RAG workflow. So RAG occurs in two parts. The first part is you need to be able to take your raw information, you know, it could be unstructured data, um, and what have you, and be able to create a numerical representation of it. And you know, today that numerical representation is the vector. So that's that first part down here. You know, the example here is like I have a bunch of PDF documents. Let's say this is like my store catalog. You have to do something called chunking it up because the way these embedding models work is that they look over a subset of the information and then they're able to assign that numerical representation to it. You put, put into the embedding model and then you store it in a vector database or a database or, you know, we'll get more into that. So that's part one. That basically builds up your data set to be able to be used for RAG. Part two is, well, I got a customer. They want to know how much a blue elephant vase costs. They come in and they ask a question, you know, how much is a blue elephant vase? So the next part is then you have to take that question and turn it into a vector because what you're going to do is you could do something called a vector similarity search in the database to find the things that most resemble your blue elephant vase. And you'll see like, oh, okay, I have a blue elephant vase. Here's the pricing information. Take that question, give the, you know, provide that additional context on price, send to the foundation model, and then get that response that we saw before. So that's part two. So the vector is important in both parts because that's basically linking that unstructured information, whether it's the, you know, the information about the products itself or the question that's coming from the customer, and it ties it all together to be able to deliver the answer to, to the user. So that's pretty cool. So I'm, uh, uh, we'll hold questions at the, at the end, please. Thank you. So that's, so that's RAG in a nutshell. 
And it's a fairly simple workflow, but there are some challenges that you know, are presented, particularly with vectors. And in the case of RAG and generative AI, the first part is how long it takes to generate embeddings. Some of these things can take you know, tens of milliseconds, hundreds of milliseconds, or depending on how busy the model is, maybe longer. And okay, maybe that's not so bad you know, if you're doing you know, this as part of you know, asking a question, but if you're generating it or you need to generate it in real time, you don't want to go through your whole data set and have to generate these embeddings all at once. You want to be able to, do, you know, be able to cache them somewhere. The other thing is that they get to be quite large. Um, you know, a lot of the models, they return you know, over 1,000 dimensions here, 1,500 dimensions, and the attribute, the individual p dimensions of the vector are uh, four byte floats. So that becomes quite large very quickly. Like one of these vectors is about six kilobytes. Again, you're probably like Jonathan, like six kilobytes is not big, but imagine you have a million of these, that's already like 5.7 gigabytes that you have to store. Now, again, you might say like, Jonathan, that's not very big. Like I have like all these PDF documents that are much larger. But if you think about it from a database standpoint, like your average database row is nowhere near six kilobytes. It's probably closer to 600 bytes. You know, it's not taking up that much space. So you have a million of these, you're already you know, paying a lot more for space. And you're like, well, look, we got compression, right? We can like shrink things down, but not really for vectors because these are a bunch of random four byte floats. Like there's no patterns that you can use to, to shrink them down. There's different techniques. Um, there's quantization techniques. There's principal component analysis where you can make the vector smaller, but you lose information when you do that. And that's part of the challenge that we're going to discuss a little bit later. So, all right. So we're already seeing that this is already pretty challenging, but what about querying them? The primary operation to compare two vectors is called, uh, a di you know, it's called a, you're finding the distance between two vectors. Um, you might hear it as a similarity search. And there's two things that go on here, is that if you want to find the vectors that are most similar to your query vector in a data set, you have to query every single vector in that data set to find the ones that are most similar to you. So again, you have a million vectors, you're doing a similarity search, you have to query all one million vectors. But wait, it gets worse, because when you do that, there's no shortcuts. You have to query against every single dimension in that data set. So if you have a million vectors, each of them with 1,536 dimensions, if a query vector, you're doing a lot of calculations there. So there's no shortcuts. Well, there's one shortcut. Something called approximate nearest neighbor search. So the idea with approximate nearest neighbor search, or again, I'm going to abbreviate to ANN, is that you can find similar vectors in your data set without searching through all of them, which sounds a lot like indexing from a traditional database standpoint. And it is a kind of index, because you are looking over a subset of the data set. And again, if you don't have to like, look at all one million vectors in your data set, if you only have to look at 100, let's say, to get your answer, that's way better. That's going to be a much faster query. And it is. It's much faster than they call it like traditional nearest neighbor search or traditional you know, <laughs> exact nearest neighbor search, which is the term we have today. But because you're not looking over every vector in the data set, you can't be sure that you're getting the most relevant results. And that goes into this measurement called recall, which is your percentage of expected results. So take you know, those you know, 10 orange blocks to the, sorry, 10 orange circles to the, the side. Let's say those are my expected results. If I have a query vector, I expect to see those 10 vectors but I only return eight of those when I search the index, my recall is 80% because I only got 80% of my expected results. For people who've been working with databases a long time, this is a very weird concept because you're kind of like, wait a second, like I put in a query, I expect to get the exact results that I stored in back, but you're saying, I'm not getting my expected results. That personally tripped me up the first time I, you know, I worked with PG Vector. I'm like, this is wrong, I'm getting the wrong results, but this is how approximate nearest neighbor search is because you're, you're looking over a subset of all the data in the set and you're making a best guess and some of these indexing algorithms are very good that you're gonna get a high, you know, high level of recall, you know, 95%, 99%, but you might not get the best answers or all the answers that you'd like to see there. So this is a very important concept to keep in mind as we go further into this journey. So before diving into one of my favorite topics, first like a very good thing to ask is when you're looking at storing vectors, is does vector storage even fit into your workflow? Like, do you need to actually have a quote vector database to store the vectors or 
Is this something where you could do it entirely in memory? You can use a library like Feist to be able to calculate everything. Um, that's one thing that you do have to determine. Like, you may not need to store vectors. But if you do, like, part of that, you know, part of that math is like, how much data am I storing? Is it millions, tens of millions, billions, hundreds of thousands? You know, and because based upon that, there's going to be all sorts of costs associated with it. I mean, as we saw, these very large vectors have a payload. You know, six kilobytes for a 1,500-dimensional vector is a lot. If you have tens of billions of those, you're probably going to look for cheaper storage. But if you have 100,000, you know, 250,000, you know, whatever it is, that's you know, that's still not that much, and. Then from there, you're going to decide you know, what makes the most sense for me. Like, do I want something that's high performance? Um, am I most interested in 100% relevancy? Like, I always need to do that exact nearest neighbor search. And you know, ultimately, what is my budget? And from there, like, once you understand which attributes are most important to you, then you can design, you can make designs for your vector database, you know, traditional things like schema design, which is you know, my favorite thing when working with a database. And you can determine, like, what's your indexing technique you're going to use? Do you need an indexing technique? You know, what's your target query time? Which brings us into Postgres as a vector store. So this is really cool, right? Because you know, Postgres has a long history. You know, I'm roughly the same age as Postgres, and Postgres has evolved through the years from being your know, traditional relational database to being you know, a geospatial database, being a time series database, being a, being a document database. And what's great is that now we can see Postgres as a vector database. And in part, is this because Postgres, from the get-go, was designed to be extensible. You can add functionality to Postgres without having to fork Postgres. And that's a really powerful concept. And what's also really cool about that is that over the past several years, Postgres added the ability to build your own custom indexing techniques you know, without leveraging one of the existing indexing frameworks in it. And this is very powerful, particularly when we're looking at vector searches, because one of the reasons why Postgres has become popular for vector searches is that it can work with your existing client libraries. Again, you know, I'll make a confession in front of a bunch of database folks. I like using ORMs when I was an app developer. It was very easy and convenient. But that's great, right? Because now if I want these you know, vector capabilities in my database, I can continue using my favorite ORM and I don't need to change anything. And that's powerful too. And also because likely in my application, my AIML data is, you know, I want to keep that in the same database as the rest of my data. And being able to have that co-location is powerful because I don't need to store my data all over the place and some, suddenly have like a distributed data problem. I can keep everything all in one place. And that's very nice. And then you get, you know, you get Postgres with your vector database because Postgres does a lot of things for you that you might take for granted. Being an asset compliant database is very important. You know, I, you know, I always like to focus on the D of asset compliance, you know, the durability that I know that if my database is writing data to the disk, it's getting stored to the disk. You know, I know, you know, that's a very powerful property, as well as the properties around like visibility and you know, you know, how things ultimately get searched. So just as a fun fact, Postgres actually has been a vector database since the get-go. The array data type was in the original, uh, was originally in the Berkeley version of Postgres. Arrays were created to help with uh, looking up access control lists within Postgres, so you didn't have to do a join out to be able to get those rules. You know, they could stay, you know, they basically, you could look at everything in one column. Now, the array, the array data type is awesome. You know, it's very versatile. It works with, you know, a, a bunch of the data types already within Postgres. And, you know, there's almost like no limits with it, as I say there. But um, it doesn't support distance operations. However, back in 2000 or 2001, uh, the cube data type came there. And the cube data type was basically able to store larger vectors of data. Actually, you could index up to 100 using the built-in, uh, you know, and with the built-in gist index, you, can, you could do like exact nearest neighbor lookups very quickly. Um, just a side note, the gist index is what PostGIS, which is that geospatial uh, capabilities for Postgres I mentioned, leverages to do very fast exact nearest neighbor searches. Now, cube is great, but it's limited to 100 dimensions. And again, like when, when I was studying machine learning, like 20 dimensions was a high amount of dimensions. So like I see like, you know, 1,536, it's like, what, what is that? That's a lot of dimensions. But the fact is that, we're limited because, you know, with the things built into Postgres, we're not able to handle these newer size vectors. So this brings us to PG Vector. PG Vector is an open source extension that gives you all the capabilities you need to be able to do vector search in Postgres. For one, it has a vector data type. You know, it has a couple of indexing methods which we're going to go into. It supports exact nearest neighbor search, approximate nearest neighbor search, 
a bunch of different distance operations. And you know, the, the, the best part of it is that you get Postgres. You can take your vector data and co-locate it with all the other data associated with your embeddings and have it all in one place. Now, I'm rushing over this slide because we're going to dive deep into like all these different things you know, during the remainder of the talk. But you know, this is pretty cool. And like, this is the power of the Postgres you know, extension framework is that if there is a new, a new kind of data pattern or some capabilities that are needed, you can build it in an extension. And also, you know, as, as we learned at the AMA yesterday, if there's something that you can't do in an extension and you need to expose something you know, in Postgres directly to enable it in an extension, that's a great, you know, that's a great you know, topic of conversation with people who are you know, contributing hacking on Postgres. Now, one thing I do want to address uh, real quick is just you know, understanding PG vector performance. And you know, there's a lot of different benchmarks out there. Um, I could probably do a whole talk just on vector benchmarking. But one thing is that you know, you know, it is like relatively fast, particularly with some of the newer indexing methodologies out there. You know, this was like one test you know, I ran just to like look at throughput. And in this case, I was actually trying to compare uh, different uh, processors. But one of the powers of Postgres is that it can scale concurrently, and it can scale vertically pretty well. And like this does apply to vector data, that if I do throw you know, more, you know, you know, more concurrent selects at, you know, at the data, and, you know, I continue to vertically scale the hardware, that it can actually go, you know, pretty far. So, you know, that's one thing to, you know, consider. You know, we're going to look at a little bit of some scaling techniques throughout the talk, but it does perform pretty well, particularly when you're looking over, like, a smaller space of your vector index. Now, as we're going to see throughout the talk, there is always going to be a tension between the speed of your queries and the recall in your queries. And there's a lot of things that you factor into recall, but just keep in mind, you know, when you're trying to decide what is your target recall, that is going to impact ultimately the speed of your vector queries. So um, I'm going to take a quick drink of water. Unfortunately, I have the handheld mic, so please bear with me a second. And now I've modeled how I can drink from a bottle of water. So distance. Distance is very important, because remember, the distance is the fundamental way that you're going to compare two vectors. PG vector offers three different types. There's Euclidean, or L2 distance, which is line of sight. So think of that as like me looking at you looking at me. You have cosine distance, which is angular distance, which is like and you have inner product, which kind of captures elements of both. All three are used. We've been seeing cosine distance has been more popular with some of the, the larger embedding models. It's one of those things where you do have to try it out. Now, all these have like different mathematical properties to them. Um, I'm trying to make sure I can get to all my slides so I didn't put a slide you know, comparing all of it. But one key thing when you're designing a vector database or you know, a vector indexing a search system is that you want to cheat wherever you can. And when, when I say cheat, you want to reduce the amount of compute wherever you can because they're costly operations. And in particular, a lot of these operations have division. And division is like the worst of all the operations. That's still to this day the most expen you know, one of the most expensive compute operations. And that's where there's this trick. There's something called the unit vector, which is basically if you take all your attributes and you find the magnitude of it, it comes out to one. You might also hear it as called as normalizing a vector. So when PG, when PG vector stores a vector, when it stores it in the vector column, that column is going to be stored as, you know, it's, it's going to store the vector, you know, as, as you insert it. But when you add it to the index, it's going to normalize it or convert it to a unit vector. And the reason you're going to do that is it's going to let you cheat when you do some of the distance calculations because you're going to be able to eliminate some of those divisions and in some cases maybe some of the multiplication operations which makes it a little bit faster because remember like whenever we're doing these operations like any place we can shave off CPU the better. I mean another note I'll just you know I'll, I'll just say right here is like you know one of the challenges with vectors too is that you kind of have to optimize like everything in your compute cycle you know CPU, memory, I.O. You know, I like to say it's just really a nasty data type because there's so little shortcuts to be able to speed things up that like any shortcut that you can get, like just take it. And you know, this is you know, this is a popular technique is storing the normalized version of the vector. The other nice thing about normalizing is that you don't lose information. But when you're looking, you know, if you were to visualize the vectors in space, you could actually see them get like clumped a little bit too much together. And that you know becomes a little bit more of an issue when you're dealing with ANN indexing. 
Speaking of, um, PG Vector provides two different ANN indexes, IVF flat and HNSW. So IVF flat is a cluster-based uh, indexing method. Uh, we're going like, to look at both of these in depth you know, throughout the rest of the talk. And what's nice about IVF flat is that um, it's relatively simple to understand. Um, it, you know, you know, when, you really, when you think about it, it's like, hey, I'm going to build clusters around a few lists. So like, define like, where my centers are and then cluster my vectors around them. What's nice is that these indexes tend to be very quick to build, but they tend to be, you know, you have to basically have all of your data preloaded up front in order to build them, in order to create the, the correct vectors. Um, can you please hold your questions till the end of the talk? Thank you. Uh, so with HNSW, HNSW is a graph-based method. So, when it, so a graph, so when you think about traditional database indexing, you store things in trees. Graphs are just a superset of trees. You know, I like to call them like slightly more complex trees. And the way HNSW works is that it organizes vectors into neighborhoods. So the idea is that when I'm trying to place a vector in the index, I'm trying to find the vectors around me that are most similar. And I might say, like, find me the most 16 most similar vectors. Once it does that, you create links to all those vectors around your neighborhood. And you know, what happens is when you do the search, you, you, know, you trace these neighborhoods to be able to find like, you know, these like, strong clusters. And more likely than not, you're going to find the vectors that you're most similar to. We're going to see a demo of how these work. Um, what's nice about HNSW is that it's an iterative index where you don't need to have your data loaded all at once to use it. You can continue to insert it. Um, but it does have a much higher build time than IVF flat. So I'll give, a, I'll give the cliff notes, like which search method do you, you, know, do you choose. It's a little bit complicated, but there's one simple one that if you need 100% recall, you got to do an exact nearest neighbor search, don't choose an index because you can't necessarily guarantee with any method you're going to get 100% recall. If you need fast indexing, you're going to choose IVF flat. And that's, you know, if you know that, if you know that you're going to need to rebuild your index constantly, you know, you're adding data in such a way where, you know, it makes more sense to just continue to rebuild and find the new centers, use IVF flat. The reason I put an asterisk is that the recent releases of PG Vector have improved HNSW build performance significantly, where this is becoming slightly less true. It's still true, but, you know, with some of the, the HNSW properties, you know, it makes more sense to use that. And, you know, just being ahead, you know, from an active level standpoint, HNSW is a lot simpler to manage. Um, it feels more like a, quote, traditional index. And it has, you know, what's nice is that it gets this high performance recall ratio in the sense that you're able to very quickly find the vectors that you're most similar to, and more likely than not, they're the most relevant to your results. Most of the vector databases out there offer HNSW as you know, the, the first index available. There are reasons to use both. You know, this gets into a deeper discussion. And I've seen people implement IVF flat in their production systems, and they're very happy with the recall and performance. So in some ways, you know, the answer is test and see which makes the most sense from you. I'd probably recommend starting with HNSW because it's a little bit easier. But again, you, know, you have choice. You know, I think you know, that definitely helps, particularly because there's a lot of other factors that go into recall beyond just what indexing strategy you use, such as your embedding model. So let's go into some uh, strategies and best practices. And I divided them up into five sections. Uh, storage, the two indexing sections. Filtering, which you know, to us database folks is the where clause. And one that I actually worked on the airplane over here today, uh, sorry, two days ago, which is distributed queries, which is kind of exciting and scary. So storage strategies. In order to understand storing vectors in Postgres, we need to understand toast. And you know, I, I can make the toast joke like, no, it's not the thing that you put in your toaster. But you know, in some ways, it kind of is. So toast is it's called the oversized attribute storage technique. And the reason why toast is important is that by default, Postgres stores 8 kilobytes of data within a page. The page is the atomic unit in Postgres that gets stored to disk. And that's you know, one of the ways that we're able to implement all the nice features around Postgres. But we have data that's larger than that, you know, text being like the first example. And Toast was designed to be able to store data that went beyond 8 kilobytes. I believe you can store up to 1 gigabyte of data in a single Toast row. Um, I, think, I think that's correct. If not, uh, I apologize. But by default, if you have data over 2 kilobytes, Postgres Toast it, which it's going to happen quite frequently with these large vectors that you have a 510 dimensional four byte float vector, it will be toasted and anything beyond that. 
so let's understand like what happens when we toast it. Because again, for like a lot of us, like we've never considered toast, you know, other than the fact that it just works up until this time, but it's gonna impact us. So Postgres has four different column storage types which impact how it gets toasted. The first is plain, which basically says store the data in line. But keep in mind if you use that, you're only allowed to store up to eight kilobytes of data, which is you know, roughly a 2,000 dimension vector. There's extended where data is stored and compressed in your toast table. This was the default in PG vector before 060, but keep in mind, there's that magic word compressed. I thought we said we couldn't compress vector data, and that's correct. We're basically wasting time trying to compress it to figure out like, oh no, we can't compress it. In fact, it's actually gonna generate something that's a little bit larger, and ergo, we're, gonna, we're not gonna compress it at all, which led to the adoption of external as the default storage type in the, the newer versions of PG vector, which you'll store it in the toast table, but it won't attempt to compress it. So we'll save some CPU cycles, because again, every bit of CPU we can save, we wanna save. And finally, there's main, which you know, just for completeness, it's here, uh, not super relevant to vectors. Now, why am I spending so much time on toast? Because it can impact your performance. So here's a, you know, Postgres has had query parallelism since uh, version 9.6, and it's a wonderful feature, and particularly if you have to do a lot of these vector computations in an exact nearest neighbor scan, you're going to use it. So I had a data set, I think it's a million, I can't read, it's either a million or 10 million, I, I can't tell, I think it's a million, but it's like, hey, you know, f you know, do an exact nearest neighbor scan on a million 120 dimension vectors. Cool, I'm gonna give you six parallel workers. So let's do the same thing on 1500 dimension vectors, and it says, cool, I'm gonna give you four parallel workers. That seems wrong, right? Like, wait a second, These, this is much smaller. Why am I getting only four parallel workers here? And that's kind of like a gotcha. Because these vectors are toasted, when Postgres is doing the query planning, it's basically seeing, you know, the toast table is actually a separate table. So it does the query plan, it looks at the main table, it's like, there's not that much data here. Because yeah, because like all the data is in like a different table and it's not considering that in the query plan. So that's a gotcha. And like we need to make some plans around that because one of the big differences between this and how Toast was originally used is that the vector's in your hot path of your query. Like it's being used you know, for serious workload. So there's some ways around this to make your life easier. One is use plain storage. If you know that your vector's not going beyond 2,000 dimensions, you can store it in line. You know, just make sure it makes sense with the rest of your queries because that is a lot of data. You know, the reason that we use Toast is to speed up queries that are in your main table. So, but if your vector, if your vector query is, you know, the raison de etro, the reason that you have that table, it may make sense to keep it in plain storage. Also, right now, PG vector only supports up to indexing 2,000 dimensions, so plain storage may make sense for that. You know, we'll talk a little bit about that that other point later. Or there's this parameter called min parallel table scan size, which can help induce more parallel workers. So. In that previous example, you know, I kept my vectors toasted and I set uh, min parallel table scan size to one. And look, 11 workers, a lot more, which is good because we can definitely benefit from a lot more workers in this case. So the reason why you know, I spend so much time on toast is you know, going back to my roots as an app developer, this would not be something I would think about at all because again, most things in Postgres, it's just like set and forget and it just works. But because this data is a little bit different and you know, because of like the size of this data, like it helps to understand these techniques to make sure that we're optimizing our performance. And there's probably a, a discussion of how do we make this simpler, and it is a fair point, and I think that's you know, something I'm personally interested in uh, helping out on. So let's get into HNSW. So HNSW stands for Hierarchical Navigable Small Worlds. Say that 10 times fast. And as I mentioned, the idea is that it's a, it's a graph, but a graph is just you know, a specialized tree, well, it's, Sorry, it's a superset of a tree. And the idea is that when we search through things, we're gonna search through a vector space where we start with a like very sparse, the, the way that I could think of it, I thought about this the other day, is like think of it like a cake. We have a cake of vectors, but instead of vectors, we have sprinkles. And let's say I designed the cake where at the top of the cake, I have a few sprinkles going down in, and each layer I get more and more sprinkles till the bottom layer has like all the sprinkles. I'm basically tracing the sprinkles through the cake that like I find like the sprinkle I'm closest to here and I go down like, oh, maybe it's here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was actually kind of a you know, very interesting algorithm. It's been around for about seven years, I think, because it did, it did basically help put folks or help put like query vectors into the right space. There's, the key with HNSW is your build. 
how you select your build parameters will ultimately impact how you're able to search over them. There's two key build parameters here. The first is M, which is the maximum number of bidirectional links between index vectors. So, you know, M, think of M as like if I'm standing here, I'm being indexed, I'm gonna build like links to like the 16 people closest to me in this room. EF construction is effectively your memory as you're going through and building the index, that you're keeping a list of all the vectors you're closest to, and ultimately you're going to choose you know, your closest 16. Um, think of it as like your search radius. Like the larger the search radius that you have, the more likely you're going to pick the vectors that you're most similar to. Now, there's gonna be, you know, there's trade-offs to this. We're gonna see, you know, the different trade-offs um, in a few slides, but you know, instead of me trying to visualize myself as like a seven-layer cake, you know, let me show you, you know, how an animated way of how a building an HSW index works. So let's say I have a bunch of vectors, and I have a, you know, a vector I'm gonna index that's in orange. What happens during HSW is you first start at the top layer. You have something called an entry point, and then you find the vector that you're closest to. So in this case, it's this one. What happens is then you go down to the next layer, and there's a few more vectors, and then you find, you know, you find ones that you're closest to, and you might build some links along the way as well, um, because that's gonna ultimately help the search that happens. And then you get to the bottom layer, you might find a few more vectors that you're closest to as you build those links, and then there you go, you're indexed. So again, oversimplified example, but that's effectively how it works. And again, in order to do that, it might take some effort because you're you know, maintaining a list of like, vectors that you've seen you know, in that EF parameter. But when you do that work up front, the payoff is in the query time. So when you query it, there's one parameter you need to be aware of, EF search. Um, and EF search is, again, similar. It's like how many of those nearest vectors are you maintaining in a list? The more of those vectors you maintain, the more likely you're gonna return a highly relevant search but there's gonna be a cost because you're maintaining a larger list that you have to look over. Um, that, must be, that value must be greater or equal to limit, by the way. So if you have like limit 50, EF search 40, you're only gonna return 40 results. So you're not getting everything that you need to see in the limit. I think a newer version of PG Vector put in like a, a check or a guard against it, but uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. And search is very quick. The idea with the search is you go, you start at the top layer, you find your entry vector, and then once you go in, you're gonna find the vector that you're closest to in that layer. Go down to the next layer, same thing. You know, I started there, I'm gonna find the vector I'm closest to. Go down to the final layer, and then you know, I'm gonna traverse the graph, I'm gonna find the vector I'm closest to. Cool, very quick. Kinda feels like a bee tree search, and in many ways it is. You know, a graph is just you know, a larger tree. So there's a few best practices, and I'm gonna say these keep evolving, and I think that's like one key point with vector searches is that this is like a very rapidly evolving field. Um, even like when I first wrote this talk, some of the guidance has changed, you know, as you can see by the, the, the second and third bullet point. The nice thing, we did a lot of testing on the default values, and like the default values usually work, though we're gonna see that, you know, based upon some, a, a recent PG Vector release, we can probably crank up EF construction a bit. Um, the other thing I just wanna mention as well is that, you know, not all HNSW is equal. Um, different vector database has, have different implementations of HNSW. Some might uh, use a library like Feist to be able to uh, perform the algorithm and you know, store it to disk. PG Vector actually implemented HNSW itself you know, based upon the paper and actually chose a different version of the algorithm than some of the other implementations. This was actually in part to make sure we could optimize it for Postgres storage. Because what you'll see with like, some of, the, some of the, the query performance from HNSW, like, it does depend on how many times you have to go to disk, how many times you have to go you know, and retrieve pages from disk. The more that you have things clustered like on the same page, the faster it's gonna be because that's gonna be less work overall as you're searching the data. That doesn't mean like, you know, there aren't some other techniques we can do to help speed things up. Um, particularly with building indexes, um, with PG Vector 051, you want to use this concurrent insert method where you'd start with an empty index and then either do concurrent inserts or copies because that was gonna be way faster. Uh, PG Vector 060 added the ability to do a uh, parallel build. So you could preload your data and then do a par you know, use parallel workers to build the index. And you know, based upon some early testing, that's looking to be a little bit faster than the uh, concurrent insert method. I will note that there was a commit earlier this week that's targeted for PG Vector 062. Um, that's gonna work much better for very large data sets. I was actually trying to build a, a billion data set with like 128 workers and I, I was noticing like, oh gee, this is not going as fast as it could. So uh, uh, Andrew Kane, who's the, you know, the primary maintainer of PG Vector, 
uh, within <laughs> within a few hours found the you know found a, a locking contention issue and solved it. By the way, uh, Andrew Kane has done an incredible job with PG Vector. I just you know want to note that for the rector, record. Um, but yeah, so I would say generally though the parallel build, if you're able to leverage parallel builds, it should be uh, a little bit faster. Now this has also updated some guidance. So you know as mentioned. Um, which, you know, it's all, for HSW, it's all about your build parameters and what you choose. And before PG Vector 060, I, you know, I would say that, you know, for instance, on this data set, it was like over a million 1,500 dimensional vectors. You start seeing diminishing returns on recall, you know, as we cranked up EF construction, that one of the reasons why the default was good enough is like you're, you're getting pretty good recall at that level. It's already 0.91. Like, do you really, really need to spend a lot more time building the index to get 0.93? I mean, this is a difference of hours here. But Rerunning the same exact test uh, using 64 parallel build workers on uh, PG Vector, well, I think PG Vector 06 to unreleased. Um, notice that we still kind of see the same degradation, right? Like, you know, we're not getting, you know, you're going from like maybe like 0.91 recall to 0.93, but the time axis changed significantly. Like, we're talking about minutes, not hours. And that's big, right? Because, like, even if I'm still seeing the same performance degradation, but I can measure it in minutes, not hours. That's an argument to say, like, hey, like, let me use EF Construction 256 instead of 64, because I will get slightly better recall, and the cost of getting that recall is not that bad. So that's why uh, you know, this is, I will say, like, this is a rapidly evolving area, but we're definitely seeing, you know, performance gains, and it is helping us to update guidance. And just in general, if you can build more I might use the term accurate. Uh, machine learning folks don't like why I use accurate here. If you can build more accurate indexes, though, it makes more sense. And again, M is a parameter that helps with that as well, that we can see, you know, th th this was uh, the, uh, the GIST 960 data set, which tends to be uh, most, uh, most approximate nearest neighbor indexes don't do well with it. But, you know, the parameter M, which is the bidirectional links, can help increase recall. But notice, like, the time penalty you pay. Again, like, we're talking about hours. So you have to decide what's most important to you when you're building this. That are you looking for better recall and you're willing to pay the upfront cost of building the index? Or do you want the index to get built quickly and you know, deal with the fact that you might not necessarily get the most relevant queries? Though, again, relevancy may make sense for you. So that's it in a nutshell um, for h &SW. Uh, you know, You have a few levers. Building's the most important thing. Um, you can always increase HNSW EF search increase recall, but it's going to be intention. It's going to decrease the performance of your queries. And the more of your data you can fit into memory, the more that you're able to, uh, the more that speeds up queries, right? Like the less trips to disk, generally, the faster things are. So at least you'll be able to keep your index in memory. Um, ideally, if you can keep your index and table in memory, that'll be the fastest. But at a minimum, you want to target the index, particularly because those could be, that's going to be the fast path. So I'm going to go through uh, IVF flat real quick. Um, so IVF flat, as mentioned, it was a clustering algorithm. Um, it's basically decided uh, based upon the number, you know, they call it list, other people call it centers, you can call it buckets, but the idea is that you, have a, you, have, you already have loaded your data set and you're going to find list of vectors that you're going to group everything around. So for example, let's say I have you know, a bunch of vectors in space, similar to the previous example. And I say, you know, I want list three, so I'm going to find the centers and I'm going to assign vectors to the lists. Then when you search over it, you have this value called probes. So if you set uh, IVA flat probes to one, that basically means that you're going to search one center. And in this case, I want to find the three closest vectors to me. So if I search just one center, these are my three closest vectors. But if you eyeball this, you're going to say, like, wait a second, like, those aren't actually the three closest vectors. Like, these are the three closest vectors. That's correct. And what you have to do is, to get a more relevant search, you have to increase the number of probes. In that case, when you increase the number of probes, you actually do find your three closest vectors. Now, that's the trick with the IVF flat, is that you often have to increase your probe value to be able to get the results that you want, but it's going to come at a cost. And you know, from what we've like, observed, it tends to be more linear uh, versus you know, more of like a gradual like logarithmic linear, which you might see in a HNSW. So there are some performance strategies, which is, you know, if you want to increase recall, increase IVF flat probes, but it does decrease performance. And I think that's been the general complaint with IVF flat, that often, you know, based upon how things get clustered, that you do need to increase probes and impacts performance. But it's kind of like, you can actually have an IVF flat 
index outperform an HNSW index because if you're able to get your list small enough and you actually get you know the the most relevant clusters, you're going to outperform HNSW because it's going to just be like very very quick queries. But again, you know I think the trade-off becomes like do you want to be, spend your, all your days you know uh, tuning uh, vector indexes or do you want to build your application? So it depends where you want to spend your time. Um, you can also induce indexing queries by lowering random page cost. Again, as an app developer, like I had rarely looked at costing parameters in Postgres until I start looking at vector indexes. And finally, you know, you can set shared buffers. Oh, sorry, not finally, but you can set shared buffers again to keep you know as much in memory as possible. And if you're looking over a lot of lists, you might want to increase the work memory parameter on a per query basis. So work memory is basically how much of your working set you're going to keep in memory before it spills to disk. Because if you spill to disk, there's going to be a penalty to that um, because you're pulling things, you know, in and out of disk to be able to perform operations. So let's say like you have 10,000 lists and you set probes to 1,000, you might exceed Postgres default working memory, and then you're dealing with that swap going between memory and disk. So best practices. Um, so a lot of these you know, I took actually from the PG vector repo in terms of how you choose the value of lists. Uh, there's an art and a science to it. The thing to keep in mind with IVF flat is that uh, as you add and remove vectors from your data set, that could end up skewing your centers, which means that you have to rebuild it to get queries that have the highest amount of relevancy. But you can use parallelism to uh, accelerate build times. And just real quick, you know, the way that it originally worked in PG vector was that when you were doing the list assignment, you would do a sequential scan on the table. Basically read every single vector one by one. So imagine you have a million, 10 million, 100 million. That's going to take a while. With parallelism, you can basically break that up and have a bunch of parallel workers do the list assignment, which um, in this experiment, uh, you know, I saw a 2x improvement. It was a, a million, 768 dimensional vectors. And some tests I saw up to a 4x improvement. So you know, again, speed is good. If you can build your indexes more quickly, generally uh, that's a good thing. Filtering. Filtering, I think, has been, the, has been the hot topic for the past, let's say, three to six months in general for, for vector databases. And, you know, I, I kind of chuckle, again, as a, you know, with my database hat on, because if this, this, is what, this is what Postgres does. You, you put a where clause on something. You filter everything out. But it gets a little bit weird with vector queries. Like everything with vector queries, it gets a little bit weird. So if I add a where clause, the first thing that might happen is Postgres chooses not to use the index, and it's like, fine, I'm going to do sequential scan. So suddenly, when you thought you had a query that was returning in milliseconds, you have it returning in seconds because it scans the entire table and then does the, you know, the fil you know, well, maybe it filters everything out, and then it, uh, you know, you, you know, you get the result of your query. It might, use, it might then end up using a vector index, but you might not get enough results because your index might be on your entire data set, not on the filter, and it's doing the search based upon what vectors are your clo you're closest to, but those vectors might not have the filtered attribute on them. You know, if, if you're, you know, back in this example, if your category ID is seven, and I return a bunch of vectors where a category ID is six, all those are gonna get filtered out, and I'm not gonna get the results that I want. Or the filtering may occur after using the index. There's actually one more thing that I need to add in here, is that you might end up using a different index to do the filtering, like a B tree on category ID, and then do the exact nearest neighbor search after, which actually might be totally fine, because if you get, say, like 100 results back, just do the exact nearest neighbor search. That's gonna be you know, super fast, and you're gonna get you know, the, the relevant results that you want. And you know, I, think that's, you know, I think that's what it is. I, I guess I got ahead. Um, the first point is that a B tree might be the, the way to go here. You might not need an ANN index, and frankly, like it's, if you can use a B tree, that's much simpler. You also need to consider like how many rows the filter would remove. Is that if you have, um, you know, let's say your filter leaves you with 50,000 rows, and you need to do 50,000 index comparisons, at that point, you probably want to be able to do that approximate nearest neighbor search. And of course, it always goes back to do you want exact results or approximate results, and you know, that's on you to decide for what you want with your application. So there's two filtering strategies to consider today. Uh, there's the partial index, another great Postgres invention, where basically you can index over a subset of your data, and that will give you, you know, that will give you that effective pre-filter where I'm looking at all of uh, all of the rows that are you know, assigned to category ID equals seven, and I can get the approximate nearest neighbor search and make sure I'm seeing all the relevant results that I want to see. Or I can partition my data if you have a clear partitioning strategy. But just be careful how you partition your data and do an approximate nearest neighbor search. Because 
if you have multiple values that match your filter within the same partition, you'll run back into the same problem we mentioned before because you're searching over all the vectors in that index and if you filter out too many that have the partition attribute, you might not actually get the rows that you want. Uh, there is a patch, actually there's several patches uh, proposed for PG Vector right now to do you know, the equivalent of multi-column indexing, which is another kind of pre-filtering, which might simplify this from an app developer standpoint. Um, not committed yet, we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, there's definitely more work on this. You know, I'd say this is still one of the areas that is being rapidly innovated on, just on vector databases in general. It's not, not just PG Vector. So last but not least, I'm actually gonna call this looking ahead a little bit, uh, distributed PG vector queries. So I'm, of, so I'm of the personal opinion that this is still scaling pretty well vertically on Postgres, but there may come a day where we need to be able to do distributed queries, where effectively, if you don't have enough memory on a single instance to be able to efficiently do your vector searches, you might wanna be able to push that down to other instances and then do a final aggregate on a single instance. Now, when you get to that point, there's a few things to consider, right? Like, one, like that memory issue I'm discussing, but also your network overhead must be acceptable because you are gonna pay some latency here. Um, finally, you have to be able to manage a multi-node system. Like, that's not trivial. You know, you, especially in production, you need to worry about availability, backups, monitoring, software upgrades, et cetera. And there's definitely a multitude of ways to do that, but as I like to say, more databases, more problems. Now, Postgres does make it possible to do this out of the box uh, using something called foreign data wrappers. Um, so here's an example where I do the setup for a foreign data wrapper to be able to query against multiple vector databases, sorry, multiple instances that contain vectors in them. Um, there's a whole discussion on security here, which is probably a talk in itself. In fact, I gave a, t <laughs> I gave a talk on that probably like 10 years ago. So uh, skipping that here. And then you have to set up what's called a foreign table, which is a reference to your remote table. Now, what I did not show you was that I actually set up these tables on the different instances, and each of them had like 2.5 million vectors in them. So there's an additional step here, but I kind of want to show the layout here because, sorry, I should have gone back here. There's two key things to add when you're setting up the, uh, the foreign server, which is you're saying like, hey, like these foreign, you know, these foreign Postgres instances have the PG vector extension loaded, and they're capable of asynchronous queries because you don't necessarily want to be able to query each database one by one, you want to query them all at once and be able to get the result back. So I did that, and you can see like, hey, I'm actually able to do the foreign scan, but actually, um, I'd say this is hot off the presses because I'm uh, still tracing it down. I wasn't doing asynchronous foreign scans. You can see, you know, based upon the timing, that it was cumulative when I did the final, the final search. Um, the other thing I'm testing right now, which actually is looking very positive, is like this is impact recall, and the answer so far seems to be no. Um, you're able to do this and still be able to maintain your recall targets, but um, ask me later in the year, possibly in May, uh, at uh, pgconf.dev 2024. So the, the thing I'm tracing down is like, can we do the async foreign scan? Um, it might have to do with an append node versus a merge append node, but to be determined. So looking ahead, what's on the roadmap for PG Vector? Um, well, as I mentioned, uh, performance improvements for massively parallel HNSW builds. Uh, that has been committed. Um, very much looking forward to that. So this is the efficient pre-filtering. To be determined what method is used, um, there's a patch for HQANN uh, to be determined, again, if that ends up going in. But again, pre-filtering is the hot topic right now. Uh, allowing more data types per dimension, you know, two-byte floats, one-byte uh, unsigned integers, and what's cool is that there's proposals for how to do this right now in PG Vector, and this allows you to do something called scalar quantization with expression indexes, where you can have your full vector stored in your, you know, your table vector column, and then do a cast to like a you know, two-byte float in your, in your vector index. And, and the powerful thing about that is that that lets us expand the amount of dimensions that uh, we can index with PG Vector. That's pretty cool, excited for that. Another technique that'll expand upon that as well as product quantization, again, being explored. Um, what we found with PG Vector was, again, things were, you know, kept scaling vertically fairly well that didn't make sense to add necessarily the quantization techniques, you know, based upon the performance numbers we saw and frankly, the, the comparable performance numbers we saw. And, you know, being able to add parallel query. The nice thing about HNSW is that we really don't need parallel query. IVF5 could benefit from, from parallel query. HNSW, to be determined, 
particularly as you expand your EF search, um, parallel query could have some benefits, but we haven't really seen much there yet. So in conclusion, you know, like JSON, a vector is just a data type. And there's all sorts of like different storage and search techniques to consider around it, but fundamentally it's a data type, and traditional databases like Postgres are very good at doing these things with these data types. As you add vectors into your application, should, should you so choose, there's always gonna be a design decision between your query performance and recall. And actually, I probably should add your index build time. Um, all those are going to be in tension, and you, you're gonna have to choose what your trade-offs are. Like, you know, as far as I know, you're not gonna be able to get everything. You can try, and maybe your data set's small enough where like, you do get everything, but as your data sets grow, you will have to make trade-offs. And you have to decide what do you want to invest in. Is it going to be at your storage layer? Like, do you need super fast storage, or do you want something that's a little bit slower, you know, based upon like, just the pure size and volume of your data set? Uh, do you want to get you know, the largest compute instance to be able to like, run super fast, massively parallel queries and index builds? Or are you going to keep something that's a little bit smaller, and you might have to deal with the fact that you do need to make fetches to disk? And then you have to pick your indexing strategy. What makes the most sense? Um, it tends to be, you know, right now HSW is seemingly the default that people are choosing, but you have to decide what makes the most sense for you. And finally, this is rapidly evolving, that you have to plan for today and tomorrow. You know, PG Vector is pretty mature. I've already seen plenty of production deployments. I've also seen a lot of kicking the tires, which is completely fine, because I think people are kicking the tires on generative AI in general. But, you know, there, you, do need to, you do need to plan for the fact that it's rapidly evolving. Like, I think the, the foundational performance features are on PG Vector minus like one or two. And then from there, it really is off to the races. I think we're gonna see, you know, even further innovations from that. So, thank you, and uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, any questions? Are there significant differences between uh, Postgres as opposed to like Chroma or Pinecone that are worth mentioning? So I'm, so I'm, not, I'm not trying to do like a, oh, I don't know this works. I'm not gonna try to do like an apples to apples or apples to oranges comparison between the different databases, but you know, I think I'd say with Postgres, you know, Postgres just has, you know, 40 year development, almost 40 year development history. Really, you know, first starting with like, how do I store the data? Making sure that I can store it safely, it's ASA compliant. And you know, there's a whole tooling. You know, th there's a lot of tools already built up around Postgres. Um, and the other thing is, you just get everything else with Postgres. I mean, if you want to like build like a geospatial time series vector database, like all in one, like that's something you can do just based upon all the the Postgres extensions that are out there. Hello. Uh, can you please give an example of how to convert attributes, let's say, in an e-commerce site? Uh, of a product into the dimensions, and also, so do all of the vectors need to be the same size, the dimensions the same order? What happens if some attributes are missing from certain uh, records? Hey, so I, I didn't understand the first part of the question, but for the, for the second part, when you run, when you build an index, uh, all the vectors within the index have to be the same, have the same dimensionality. You can have you can store mixed vector types within a, within a Postgres database, even within the same column, but then when you build the index, you have to make sure all those vectors are of the same dimension. So the first one was, you showed in the example how you have dimensions of 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Yes. How do you get to those numbers from the actual record that you're trying to compare? So is it like if I want to like introspect those numbers directly? Or is it like how did, how did I get how did I make uh, up those numbers? Yeah, I'll oh, so that was just an example I contrived. Like what's happening with the generative AI models that I have like some text like, you know, vectors are the new JSON, and I take that, put it into the embedding model, and it's going to generate the, the the attributes. But that's on that's basically about how the embedding model is defined and how how it's able to do that. Uh, that's on that's on it. Just final question. Yeah. And I, I can answer questions outside after. Yeah. Thank you. I was just wondering, um, with your RAG diagram, uh, when someone queried the database, it, in the diagram, it also insert it back into the database. I was wondering, when you insert uh, new data, do they have to rebuild everything for the vector? Or so no. Uh, one of the 
so even with both IVA Flight and HNSW, you don't need to rebuild everything when you insert it. And in fact, with Postgres, it's, it's an online insert. So as soon as you insert the record into the table, it's automatically going to get inserted into the index. Now, IVA Flight and HNSW have different properties around the insert. Because HNSW is iterative, it's kind of like building a traditional B-tree index where you insert it, and you're going to put the vector in its highest probability space of where it occurs. With IVA Flat, because it's cluster-based, what happens is that you will insert it into a cluster, but over time, your centers are going to skew. So the centers you have represented are not necessarily the true centers anymore. In that case, you might want to rebuild in order to get better results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.